Welcome to episode one of the Came Kit Bag. I'm Gavin Buckle, and for many months, the founder and original race director of the Came Marathon, Estian Arendt, together with his wife Nadia, have been trying to convince me to take part in this year's event. I'm an avid cyclist as well as a trail runner. However, I've never taken part in any running marathon, let alone an extreme one. So I have many questions that I need answered. I'm hoping today's guests will be able to answer them for me. Joining me remotely is Russell Nugent, who is this year's KM Race Director. And in studio is Benny Roo, winner of the KM 2018. Good morning and welcome, gentlemen. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Good morning. In today's episode, we'll cover numerous things included in those 10 weeks to came, preparation and training, what to expect in terms of the terrain, the route, the equipment needed, how to pack your backpack, as well as training and getting used to the food that will be consumed during the race. Uh, first of all, Russell, you are this year's race director and have also taken part as a participant in the event. Briefly, how did you become involved in the marathon? And what led you to become this year's race director? Gavin, well, the Kalahari Okrawi's Extreme Marathon takes place in my backyard. I live in Uppington, and from day one, I took note of the event, um, always threatening to take part. But I, I was for many years a triathlete. Um, and then when I saw the light and started trail running, um, the, the, the Kalahari Okrawa's Extreme Marathon became a bucket list event for me. And eventually in 2018, um, one of my patients who, who, who owns property that the, uh, that the race crosses convinced me to, to take the plunge and enter. And so, yeah, 2018, the year that, that Benny won, um, was the year that I took part for the first time, although I had been aware of it for many years. Um, and then in 2019, obviously, with, as with so many other people, once you've done it, once you've done this event once, you always come back and back and back. And 2019, I took part again. And at the end of the race, um, I said to, to Nadia and Essien, uh, you know, I'd like to get involved um, at a, a sort of organizational level. I live in Uppington and, I, and I'm so close to where it takes, part, it takes place. Um, I thought I could maybe add value. And in that year, 2019, you finished second overall with a time of 27 hours and 25 minutes. Uh, was your motivation to come within the top three? Um, you know, Gavin, I'd, I'd be hesitant to say that. You know, I don't think I don't think this race is is where you should be aiming for positions unless you're an elite athlete like Benny or somebody like that who makes a living out of it. But uh, to be honest, I don't think you should be aiming for positions. I think your first priority should be to finish this and uh, take wherever you wherever you finish i was lucky and fortunate to finish in second spot but i mean it could have gone i could have finished second last if i'd if if everything hadn't gone well so when you were uh, taking part in the race were you clock watching uh definitely not i was mile watching i'll tell you that i was uh, looking to see how many kilometers i left had left of the stage but i definitely wasn't watching to see uh see how fast i was crossing the ground no for sure not before that 50% through each day, don't you find it a bit soul destroying when you're watching the miles and one mile or kilometer just seems to take forever? Um, the first couple of kilometers in each day take a bit long, but then after that, they seem to just sort of flow into each other and they go pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, I'd, rather than watch the kilometers, maybe you should just look at the scenery. It makes it go quicker. Now, you live in the Northern Cape, so your body is, to a certain extent, acclimatized to the harsh heat conditions. Do you think it gave you an advantage in the race? Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely. Uh, the living close by or just living in South Africa in the summer definitely gives us, an, gives us an advantage. Folks that are coming from the colder climates like Europe and things are definitely uh, struggle a little bit more initially. Now, when people have a look at this race, they think it's an extreme running marathon. But according to the statistics, only 20% of the participants run the entire event. Did you run the event? Uh, definitely not. <laughs> no, no. I took, uh, I took strategic walk breaks, definitely. And there are, there are river beds um, and, and lots of sand, which... Uh, which uh, it's not a good idea to run through. Um, you, uh, percentage wise and, and energy sparing, it's definitely better to walk those. 
when would you run and when would you walk? I, I would run when it's easy and when it's when when I uh, sort of using perceived effort as a as a, um, a a yardstick. I would when the perceived effort became a bit much, then I would slow down to a walk. And do you find it easier running uphill, level, or downhill? No, I don't really have a preference. I just, yeah, it doesn't matter to me. When you reach those uphills, you don't think, no, this is when I need to take a bit of a break. Uh, not necessarily. In, in with, with Kane, you don't have massively long uphills. So you're not going to have Mon Von 2 type climbs. Um, so, so it is possible to run all the way up them. Again, it just depends on how you feel, how tired you are, how sore your legs are, that kind of thing. It's all about perceived level of effort. If you feel you're struggling, take a break and walk. If you're feeling strong, then yeah, carry on running. In 2019, you did well because you came second in the race. What was your motivation to move away from taking part in the race itself as a participant and then moving more towards the management of the race? Uh, to be honest, I thought uh, second was uh, going to be about as good as it, as good as it gets. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to do much better than this, and and uh, yeah, okay, so I've done this now, and uh, but I'd I'd like to stay involved with the race at some level. So I thought, well, yeah, let's get into the organisation and planning routes and things like that. And you mentioned a little early on that people do return to this race. In my mind, to a certain extent, it is a bucket list race. So perhaps you only do it once. You're now more in the organization part of it. Do you think you'll take part as a participant again at some stage? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, if, if, if my organizational responsibilities allow, I'll definitely take part. Um, and in planning and, and for the route this year, I will have run the route a couple of times in, it, in its entirety before the race even starts. So, I mean, I'll miss out on the social, but I'll definitely have, have run the route and, and been around a few times. Benny, speaking about participants, you're a legend when it comes to this race and many other similar type of races. And evidently, you're affectionately known as Aster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give me a bit of the backstory of Aster. I don't know. It, it, it just came about. I think it's, a, it's a, probably a free state thing. It's, it's come from the farm. So if, you, if you're strong or you're tough, they call you Aster. So it has and nothing it, at all to do with running or extreme marathons or what have you. When, when did you adopt the Aster no, it terminology? Was, it, it was during these crazy trail runs of mine that, that the name actually got stuck. <laughs> and how did you get into trail running? Well, let's first start. At, at school, I was purely a cyclist, a road cyclist. So, right. Yeah, it's quite a jump to where I am now. Um, so my brother ran comrades in his matric year. And then when I got to matric or just after matric, um, University of Pretoria, I thought I must just show my brother because I'm very competitive. I, I must just show him how to, to run comrades properly. And um, yeah, I got, I, at first I hated running. I couldn't run three kilometers without taking a walk break. And um, I did three comrades. I stopped for a couple of years and um, got back into it. And when, when road running got too boring, I jumped over to trail running. And boy, did the light came on then. Um, it's, it's just so much more fun. What was the change in your metabolism, in your fitness, when it w moved from not being able to run a continuous three or five kilometers to being able to get into a rhythm and a pace in order to do things like comrades? I think the, the, the change in met met metabolism is, is just one of the great rewards of running because now you can eat and drink so much more <laughs> so it really changed my life i think if if running didn't cross my life i probably would have end up in jail <laughs> <laughs> and 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 kalahari ohrabis how did you get involved in that um it's one of those big races that i've been watching and um i have quite a few friends who did it every year and um i've been watching it and watching it and and uh, yeah, 2018, I got the opportunity to, to take part and it was one of those bucket list races, really bucket list races. I mean, top three of my bucket list 
events would be KM. I think the toughest decision there is is um, is how to pack your 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 technical stuff because it is way different from any other race because you have to carry six days food, um, six days clothes, six days race um, energy stuff. So um, it's it's a lot of planning, but I think m with these races, the planning part is sometimes the the best part of it because you you spend months ahead planning and planning and checking how you can get your bag a little bit lighter. What can you take? What can you leave? It's a very different race. There's there's no other race like like this. Now you've taken part in many other uh, marathons and extreme marathons. Came, how does it compare internationally to the others? No, it's definitely up there. Um, I think that the main difference, again, uh, which I want to um, really focus on, is with KM, it's, it's not just a one-day event and you get fed by the race organizer or stuff like that. You really have to plan. And um, I think I, I was lucky the first three days of the race and then living on two-minute noodles really got to me. Um, I didn't sleep well because I didn't take that that much um, of a of a sleeping bag or a um, I had a sleeping bag it's compulsory but I took the lightest one that I can get and it's not always the warmest one so I slept very cold and I didn't have a mattress or a blow-up mattress or anything like that um, just to save on weight and um, <laughs> my cushion was actually my running shoe and that was ter a terrible decision. I, if I go back again, I would I would really rather carry a little bit more weight, but having that extra comfort and and a little bit better food. So, do you believe the way you pack your bag and all of the accessories that you take along? Do you think that can be a make or break? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if you run out of f fuel or food, it's pretty much the end of your race. Um, you're not allowed to take food from any other participant. That's w one of the rules. So um, if you run out of fuel, you run out of fuel. They, they only supply you with water. So if, you, if you're strong enough, you can live on water. <laughs> I think it will, it will work. Carrying too much on your back the first few days is also going to kill you. So where's the, where's the magic uh, weight? I don't know. We did weigh in our bags, and I think I was the lightest. But yeah, I, it, I really paid the price on the last day. It's been recommended that I take a 30 to 35 kilogram bag, yep. but that doesn't mean that my contents are 35 mm. kilograms. That's literally just according to the specifications of the manufacturer, how many liters of water you can fit into it if you were going to fill it. So the size of your bag? I think it's a 25 liter. So it's a little smaller. It is a little smaller, yeah. And what does it weigh when you weigh in? Uh, if I remember correctly, I was uh, seven and a half kgs. Yeah. Seven and a half kilograms. Yeah. yeah. This year, you're kind of 50 50. In other words, you weren't planning on taking part, but there is a chance, a chance that you might. What, between Russell and I, hmm. what can we say to convince you to <laughs> fill in that entry form and to join us on the 6th of October? You know, I got such a rubber arm, eh? It's, <laughs> it, you don't even have to, to ask nicely. I'll just pitch up. I think. Uh, so, are you going to take part? Are you? Yes, I am. Then it's a deal. And the, the difference <laughs> is. Benny, you, I'll tell you, I've you, got it here on video. I've I heard that. <laughs> I heard that, Benny. <laughs> no problem. As long as there's no expectations, because uh, I'm going to run with, with, with the backpack, with the party pack. You're a cyclist and you've done cycling for a number of years. You're a comrades marathon runner on numerous occasions. You're an extreme marathon runner and what have you. I have never in my life run a race. So this is quite a daunting task for me. So it's going to be absolutely amazing to have somebody like you and 
Russell and what have you motivating me at the back of the pack. No problem. We'll be there. Here in Gauteng, there are plenty of trail running and hiking venues, but none of them with thick sand. And when I was speaking to Estian a few weeks ago, I showed him some of the pictures of where I go trail running, mm. which is in the cradle. And he said that's great, but it doesn't compare to the thick sand that we'll encounter during the race. What is worse, technical sections that you find on a lot of trail running or the thick sand? The thick sand, the first day will be terrible for you. And then you get used to it. it it's almost like there's a technique to run it. You'll learn it uh, naturally on the first day. So don't stress too much about the thick sand. If you can find a spot, but yeah, you won't find one in Gauteng. But if you can find a spot, try, try and um, train on thick sand. For me, technical running is it's much more difficult. Um, going up a steep mountain with big boulders and rocks, it's way dif more difficult than running on, on thick sand. Thick sand isn't that bad. Like Benny says, you'll get used to it and you'll, you'll learn the technique on the first day. Um, but, but if you can get something, um, they call gaiters. I don't know if they've told you about gaiters. I've got some here. Um, that you 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 put over your over your shoes so it sort of covers the top of your shoe and your ankles and it keeps the sand out because that's probably one of the the biggest irritations about running on sand is that the sand gets in your shoes and if you don't pay attention to that then it'll cause blisters which will come back and bite you in the bum towards the end of the race so so if you can if you well this this should be a definitely a must have or a, or a set of gaiters that you can you can cover cover your shoes with and keep the sand down. So basically they go around your shoe and then attach to your ankle via uh, some form of elastic? Yeah, the elastic and Velcro, yeah. And do they allow your feet to sweat? Absolutely, absolutely. And some of the, some of the shoes uh, have got, I think I've got a pair here, they've got like little places that you, you, you'll attach the gaiter here and you'll attach the gaiter to the front and to the side. And then it, it sort of covers this part of the shoe and goes up your ankle. So all the, the top half, all the openings on the shoe are covered and it keeps the sand out. And these gaiters, can a person buy them at sport shops? Yeah, you can buy them at sport shops. You can buy them, you can buy them online. Um, a couple of the, like ultimatedirection.co.za make a nice brand of, of gaiter. Ultra, the shoes that Benny and I like to wear, they, they um, uh, uh, make a nice uh, gaiter as well. Now, when a person does trail running and uh, uh, obstacle running and things like that, there is a high chance that a person can get injured with rocks. During KM, are there many injuries? Not because of the technical terrain. Um, I think, I think the, the medical personnel um, are given work by things like blisters and maybe tripping and a grazed knee and things like that. Um, but you're not going to have somebody falling off a cliff and getting concussed or breaking a neck or something like that. Speaking about blisters, how strong does my stomach have to be? Because I've seen the videos of KM and I've seen the medics take a needle with a piece of thread and thread it through the blister. And then I spoke to Estian and Nadia and I said, that's great. Then do they just pull it out afterwards and allow the blister to drain? And they said, no, you leave the thread in there and you run with the thread in your foot. You know, Gavin, I would plan not to get blisters. I would, uh, I would, I would plan not to get blisters. I do absolutely everything you can you can do to avoid them. So wear good good quality socks that are nice and tight fitting that don't move around on your foot and and the gaiters and empty your shoes out if they get sand in them. But yeah, do your best to avoid them um, rather than have to look at those threads sticking out of your foot. Benny, have you suffered blisters? Not as much, but I do get them. Um, the odd occasion, I don't, I can't tell you when or why, but. That needle in the thread, it, it sounds terrible, but you won't feel a thing. That, that, the needle goes through a de almost a dead piece of, of skin, and that thread helps to drain that, um, that the fluid, liquid. That the liquid. liquid, yeah, it keeps on draining it. Because if you just pop it, that, that hole no normally 
closes within mm. minutes and then you sit with the same blister. So the thread actually is, is like a drain. And when you look back at the times that you did get blisters, where were those blisters? Were they on the sole of your feet, on the ball of your foot, on your toes? Normally on my toes. I've switched over to Njinji socks. Right. It's like a sock. It looks like a glove. Yes, so I've seen them. In other words, it goes around yes. each, each toe. So now your skin doesn't uh, touch each other. It mm-hmm. touches wool. It feels uncomfortable the first time, but um, it actually allows for more drainage or, or sweating to, to, to weak away. So it, it really works well for blisters. And are those locally available? They are, yes. Uh, Russell, you would agree that perhaps a person should get those, basically you could call them foot gloves? You know, Gavin, this is where the personal aspect of it, I can't stand those things. What I do agree with Peggy is that, that, it's, that blisters are all about friction. So you want to avoid friction between your skin and another surface, whether it is a loose fitting sock. So loose fitting socks are out and you don't want any friction between obviously your skin and the shoe. So so my, my top tip is to wear um, socks that are almost half a size or one size too small for you so that they fit nice and snugly on your foot and that there's no movement between the sock material and your skin. Last question on the sock category. There are many different socks available. If you go to one of the sporting shops and you have a look at the shelves, there are socks for walkers, there are socks for cyclists, there are socks for runners, there are socks for trail runners, there are sweat wicking socks. And then you could go to, for example, a normal clothing store and buy a pair of toweling socks. From your experience, Russell, Benny, which are the best? Yeah, like I said, it's a personal preference type of thing. So in the same way that you have your personal preference as far as shoes are concerned, I get socks. Um, the two times you make a very nice sock. 2XU is the brand. And then I also get socks um, from my friends in Spain. They introduced them to me. But bottom line is, is if you can find a sock that just fits nice and snugly, um, that's the way to go. You've got enough time now. Buy a couple of pairs and try them out and see which ones work. If I can add to that, if you don't like the glove sock, uh, a nice moe, moe, and a nice thick one that's, that fits nice and snug. And you don't find that your feet overheat? No, you, you would think a, a thick sock is going to be much warmer. It's actually the opposite. It, it, it allows that, that moe allows for much more airflow and wicking of this, yeah, no. Definitely. Don't go for a thin sock. Everybody think a thin sock, it would be cooler. Mm. It's quite the opposite. Russell, the route, I believe it is only made available just before the race. In other words, everybody flies or travels into Uppington and from there they catch a uh, shuttle through to Hrabi's. And it is only on the day or so before the race that the route is revealed. Are there any surprises in this year's route? Well, if it's the first time, it's all of it's going to be a surprise, Gavin. Um, <laughs> STN has done this so many times. Um, we we sort of cut and paste sections of the route, but um, yeah, I don't know if it, STN. Well, yeah, I suppose you'll probably watch this video, but I've got a surprise for STN as well. They won't be nasty surprises, but um, and and if you've done the race a few times before, you'll see familiar sections. What is the chance of me being a novice getting lost en route? Gavin, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to comment on your intelligence, but if you've got a, a, <laughs> a, an average intelligence level, then you're not going to get lost. You need to switch your brain off for a while to get lost. If I can add there, it depends on how much of a man you are. Because if you're a man like you me... You don't ask directions. You, you don't ask directions. And, and um, if you don't see a marker, you'll, you'll, you'll find it in the next 50 case. <laughs> the golden rule is if you don't find a marker, track back until the, you find the last marker that you were at. doesn't matter how f- quick you go if you're going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Russell, how far are these markers placed from one another? Um, it depends how sort of open the route is and how obvious the route is. Um, if you if you if you need to change direction, that will be marked. Um, and if it's a particularly sort of complicated section, we'll 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 mark them um, closer together. But on average, probably about two three hundred meters apart. Um, if you if you're on a long on a rock stretch of district road, for example, then it might be a bit further apart.
A word of advice that was given to me recently, if for some reason you need to veer off the main route, in other words, you need a bathroom break or whatever the case might be, best idea is to leave your bag on the route. Is that still valid? Yeah, definitely. We'll definitely include that in the race briefing for sure. Now, when I started considering doing this race, me, I'm not necessarily a camper. And perhaps that isn't even relevant because if we have a look at the kit that is required for this, it isn't really camping kit. There is a sleeping bag, but it isn't a super comfy sleeping bag and you need to carry as minimal as possible. Going through my mind, some of the questions, um, what sort of cap do I need? My headlamp that I buy, is it bright enough for the long run? In other words, that 75 kilometer day, navigating along the route. Short or long sleeve shirts, because a person would think that you would be cooler with a short sleeve t-shirt. However, I believe long sleeve also works well and it keeps the sun uh, off, off your arms and stops you from burning. And also, what about running? Do you run in shorts or tights? And my list carries on and on and on, which we will revert back to. But can we start on, for example, can some of the participants just wear a visor, others wear a cap, others wear a bit of a kind of a broom hat, and others wear what is kind of termed as a fisherman's cap. What do you suggest for headgear? Russell's got that beautiful orange hat. <laughs> i tell you what I did the, the first time that I thought I was concerned about getting sunburnt and getting burnt and things like that. Um, so I, I, I had an orange hat. Um, <laughs> In my cupboard that I that I wore, and it's sort of just sort of stuck as a trademark now. Everybody can see me from miles away. Um, but it's got a slight brim all the way around, so it's got a brim 360 degrees all the way around, um, and and that that was my sort of choice um, for for as far as headgear is concerned. I know some people wear peaks and and these sort of um, trucking caps and that kind of thing, but then I'm always concerned my ears are going to get burned to the back of my neck and that kind of thing. Uh, so my, I think it's important that whatever headgear you wear should be to protect you from sunburn and to keep the sun out of your eyes. Benny? I have a peak. Um, a, a peak as in the same kind of cap that Russell mm, is wearing at the moment or just a tennis peak? Yeah, those tennis peaks, so it's open at the top. Okay, yeah. and you don't get sunburnt on your, on your head? No, you, no. You, you still have a bit of thatch on top, <laughs> at least that stops the, the sun. I have a problem with that. Yeah, if I were you, I would put on a full hat. You yes. Know? protection um i'm one of those lucky guys I, I it will probably bite me when i'm older but i don't even use sunscreen at all you don't not at all your nose doesn't get burnt no, your arms nothing moving on moving <laughs> on to your arms uh what kind of shirt would you wear all six days i did in a short sleeve shirt so okay yeah as your nickname you've got aster skin <laughs> so it doesn't burn <laughs> In the Kalahari, in the hot sun of the Kalahari. So you're fortunate there. Uh, Russell, what did you wear? I wore shorts, short sleeves and shorts, um, but, but I, I applied sunblock liberally. Um, that was important. But, uh, but I just, yeah, I didn't wear arm or other sort of sun protectors on my arms. But, but some guys do. It's not a bad idea. Is it a spray on sunblock or do you take the cream? I took the cream a little. The, the the cans are too big. The spray on are too big to fit into my bag. So I just took a small tube. Again, size and, and weight and everything like that are, are are quite important. Now, speaking about size and weight, during the day, obviously, the temperatures range between 25 and 55 degrees. But in the night, it does become colder. Mm -hmm. And especially on the long night where uh, 75 kilometers, I think this year is 78 kilometers, if I'm not mistaken. Well, on the running, um, you won't you won't get that cold while you're busy exercising or moving. Mm. You don't get that cold. But when you go to bed or you you sleep, it does get pretty nippy. And so you obviously can't pack a big jacket into your mm. bag. So what type of jacket? Again, there I have a little moe um, long sleeve top, right. and, and it's quite thin and and very lightweight and it works well on your skin. You, you must try to wear it on your skin and not a uh, t-shirt between. I need to just remind you of what you committed to at the beginning of this discussion, <laughs> that you're going to be the back guys. Mm -hmm. So you're going to need that jacket because you're <laughs> going to be walking with me. I just had my daughter bring me my cap. This is, this is the cap that I wore. <laughs> so Benny, Benny will know it well. <laughs> If you get lost along the route, at least that helicopter just has a look for the orange peak, the orange cap, and they will find you. The race director will be out on the route wearing that thing. 
The type of jacket that you would suggest? I just had a thin windbreaker. Um, it's not it's not that cold. Another make or break point, obviously your shoes. Do you buy running shoes? Do you buy trail running shoes? Do you buy hiking shoes? Well, there's, there's, there's certain parts that, that you run on, on quite um, open rock. And I think your normal running, road running shoe won't do the job there. Um, so I would really uh, stick to my trail running shoes. Trail running mm. shoes. Russell, you also have a pair of trail running shoes? Absolutely. I definitely stick to the trail running shoes um, just for a little bit of extra grip. And they've, they've, they've got nice firm toe boxes and things like that if you stub your toe on the rocks, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I would definitely go with the trail running shoes. If you're going to be walking the whole way, I mean, if that's your plan, I don't know. I don't know whether I don't know what Benny thinks whether hiking shoes might be be appropriate. I don't know, but I mean I didn't consider that I was running. If you're just gonna walk the whole the whole race, um, hiking shoes would probably do the trick. But I think hiking shoes normally is a bit heavier mm. than trail running shoes, so I would rather also go for the lighter option. Now along the route at the watering points, does it mention how many kilometers you've done and how many there are to go? We don't have route markers and things like that, but you do get a you do get a race booklet, so you will know when you get to water point number three on day two that you will have covered eighteen k's, and at the next water point is seven and a half k's away. So you can judge your distance um, by that. How big is the race book? Oh, it's a little thin A5 booklet. A person tends to forget about or intentionally not go into your bag as much as possible because obviously your concentration is running and your time and what have you so if that booklet is in the back of your pack and not in a front pack it's not like for example in the dakar rally where they have a specific route marker in front of them that they can follow so with this book chances are it's going to be in your backpack yeah i, I would keep it accessible i mean the backpacks have got pockets all over the gaff um so you can stick it into the front next to your bottle. Just, yeah, keep it accessible. You can even put it in your pocket. And with that in mind, did both of you run with uh, fitness devices so you would know how many kilometers you had done and so you could pace yourself and you would monitor your heart rate and your speed? Yes, yes, I, I do run with my Garmin. I also ran with the Garmin. It was challenging to have battery that lasted that long. So so just, I mean, make sure that either you you adjust the settings on your device so that it's going to last all week or maybe think about taking one of those um, battery pack type things along. Sleeping bags and sleeping mattresses or uh, mats. Both of you use mats or did you sleep just on the floor? I took a blow up mattress. I wasn't like Benny. Some of these guys take sun visors and things. You know these sun visors that they put up inside the car? They take those to sleep on but but I, but I think it's important to try and get as good a night's sleep as possible. So I had a blow-up mattress, which sort of, it was quite compact, and I just stuffed it at the bottom of my bag. Absolutely. Uh, if I do it again, I would have a blow-up mattress. That sun visor, it helps absolutely nothing. Nothing, nothing. You can just leave it at home. And in the different sleeping areas, how is the ground? Is it just raw sand? Is it rock? Is it grass? It's not a five-star hotel, and some of the, the the pieces that we'd had next to the river where they'd been nice sort of softish lawn, um, they've all been washed away now by the floods. So so your accommodation, your digs this year are not probably going to be as comfortable as they have been in the past, but we try and find you a level piece of ground to sleep on here. And then we cover the ground with like a ground sheet, so so yeah, but it, it's, it's, not, it's not a feather bed mattress for sure. Speaking of the importance of a good night's rest during a race like this, uh, a whole bunch of men and women sleeping in the same area. Some people snore, other people don't. Some people don't like going to bed early and so they chitter-chatter into the night and other people want to sleep. And I believe that some people don't even sleep under the gazebos and on the, the ground mats. They go and sleep away from the crowd. Uh, sleeping tablets? That would really help. I, I didn't take with, but if I go again, I'll definitely pop a sleeping pill every night. I don't really like sleeping. They make me a bit woozy the next morning, but I mean, take earplugs, because there are a couple of guys that snore loudly, and other guys that have got sleeping bags that sound as though they're sleeping in a packet of chips. So there are those kind of things to deal with, but but you you bug it by the end of the day. Um, you'll, you'll sleep, and everybody goes to bed early. 
Let's move on to your fueling and your food and whatever you. Breakfast, lunch and supper. From a time perspective, breakfast is obvious because you get up at a designated time and you can eat and what have you. Suppers, obviously, when you finish the race and what have you. But lunch is a bit of a gray area because in theory, you're eating lunch on the run. Mm. Breakfast, lunch and suppers. Can you suggest? Well, for, for breakfast, I, I had that future life uh, porridge. Yes. You just add water. So, yeah, whenever you make food, you always try to use as much as possible water because that that you have <laughs> that they supply you should never carry too much wet stuff with you right it must be completely dry like two the, minutes the noodles. dehydrated foods dehydrated foods yes yes um some people like to take um like tuna in a tin or in, a, in that other foil you you get a a, a food um it's made for hiking it, i think it's called nom nom right and um it's very heavy, but it's good food. Okay. So it's, again, everything is weight. Um, so breakfast, I did Future Life. Sorry, I've got, I've got some of the, the um, things, that, food that's made for hikers that, that I took. And you just add boiling water to it. And they've got all sorts of different, I mean, this is chicken tikka masala. And it provided you enough carbs and protein to replenish what you had used up during that day. Well, for sure. I mean, pr- provided you your your other things, but but I mean, as far as a, as a nice meal goes, these are great. Um, you just add boiling water, and you don't even have to take a. You you eat it straight out of the bag. You sort of cut the top off. You cut the top off, and then fold it over, and then this serves as a as a as a dish as well. So so you can eat it straight out of this thing. So that saves you carrying a a, a bowl or whatever. You know, so they, they're great. And they, this is chicken tikka masala. They got freaking everything. Um, beef stroganoff and lamb teriyaki, all that kind of thing. And then your lunches, you do that on the run? Uh, I would rather finish the running, except for the long day. The long day you, um, you have to, but you don't make lunch. You just eat more. You, you, you pack differently. So you'll, you'll have more biltong with you or dry horse or whatever like you do, do comrades you don't stop and have lunch so it's basically snack food mm. that you eat throughout the race yes and and preferably you don't have that in your backpack you have that in a front pack or your side pouches yes absolutely same as benny except for the long day that i i um but but i would wait until i finished and i would have my sort of energy um product of choice Almost more important than your breakfast and your lunches are during the race itself, your rehydration and your electrolytes that you lose. Now, I was doing a bit of research and you can sweat between half a liter to four liters every hour, depending on your speed and your fitness and the ambient temperature and what have you. How do you manage to replace your electrolytes during the race? I take a lot of tablets um, with me. So it would always be magnesium and, and calcium and sodium. and You get so many products out there. Do you pop them into your water or do you put them straight into your mouth? No, no, I pop them into the water. So I'll, I'll always run with two bottles in the front and one will have um, electrolytes and the other one would be pure water. I, I always love clean, pure water mm. for one. Um, and the other one would be juices and whatever. During the day, like Benny, like Benny said, I mean, I wouldn't change. I also just had my water and electrolytes. And the foods that you would eat for breakfast and for supper. Future Life is a common food that a lot of people eat, and you don't necessarily need to get used to it. But, for example, the dehydrated food that you suggested, Russell, it is something that you wouldn't normally eat on a daily basis. Did you buy a few of these prior to the race and then eat them for suppers to make sure that your mm. system is used to them? Because the last thing you want before or during the race is to have an upset stomach because that will literally take out all of your energy. Absolutely. I, did, I bought a couple of extras and tried them out. Um, I'm pretty used to the future life and the oh, so easy and that kind of stuff. So that's not new to me. Um, but these dehydrated things were new to me. So I bought a few extra and tried them out. But they're great. Oh, they, yeah, I mean, they're not fantastic, but they're good enough for there. It never created an upset stomach or anything like that for you? Not at all, no. I recently switched over to PVM and they have a, a millipop, a pre-cooked millipop, and uh, that is just amazing. Also, you can just mix it with boiling water and um, I think that's probably the best breakfast you can have. 
And the PVM, where is this available? Uh, also, all the sports sports stores, and as well as online, you can get. You know. Your bags. I can show you the bag as far as this is a thirty liter bag. Um, so these are the kind of bags that we ca- that we take. Yes, I I think probably just the older model than than yeah. what you have in the, there. Uh, this yeah. is a, it's quite a nice vest bag, so it's it fits really nicely. Um, it's snugly, it doesn't move around on your back. So these are the sort of things that that you should that you should maybe look at. Yeah, getting one of these. What is the brand? It's Ultimate Direction. And available where? I think yeah, in in, in uh, Joburg. Uh, uh, what's that? Blank Drifters. Yeah. yeah. And any suggestions on how to pack your bag? Do you put your sleeping bag at the bottom and then your foods, or how does it go? To be honest, Gavin, you unpack your bag every day and repack it again. So, so yeah, you'll um, just when you, when you start each stage, make sure the things that you're going to need, like maybe your food or your nutrition for that day, are sort of towards the top and accessible. And you put your sleeping bag and your mattress to the bottom, but you're going to unpack that bag every night and then repack it again, especially because you it's sort of as you're going along, it empties out. Both of you are quite familiar with this event. You are, to a certain extent, a super sportsman, and so you're fit most of the year. But for a novice like me, how do you suggest I start my training and then progress towards the race itself? Because I also believe you can overtrain. Absolutely. So um, you told me at the beginning you are a cyclist. So you you have a decent fitness level Mm. at least. That helps a lot. And you've been cycling for years now. For probably. years and years. And, and, right. and what I've done is over the last three months, mm-hmm. I've been running and trail running mm-hmm. and things like that. But uh, a lot of professionals will say you need to do X within the first three weeks mm-hmm. and uh, harder or more distances over the next few weeks. What do you suggest? When I approach something big like this, I always take a 12-week view or 12-week we plan I plan yeah i don't think we have 12 weeks do we <laughs> <laughs> i'm 10 weeks we 10, 10 weeks, weeks and counting it's not too bad it's not too bad at least you you got that that basic fitness level week five um would be your toughest week um five weeks before the race you must really try and do the most mileage even if it's really slow and you're really tired but that week is the make or break week if you can push yourself to, what 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 kind of mileage are you doing now? Uh, during the week, I uh, walk with my mm-hmm. uh, ten kilogram backpack That's on, so it's a walk and a jog. Yeah, uh, I do about nine kilometers every day. Mm-hmm. But what I do is I break it up. I walk two days and then I cycle mm-hmm. and then I walk two days and then over the weekend I do about a twenty to a thirty kilometer trail run. That's great. No, I think you you on the right track there. Um, that week five, I would try to, 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 if you can, do 20k a day. Okay. Obviously taking it very easy. Um, and if you're taking strain, rather take a break and, and, and take a day off. And also, you must do one super long run, like 40, 45k's at least. Don't know, what did you plan for a long run? I'm too scared of thinking of long <laughs> runs at the moment. So my, my feet don't agree. Yeah, and then and it's, sometimes it's difficult to do it uh, alone. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing you're training alone. Yes. If you can find a race or whatever that's like 40Ks or 50Ks, even if it's just a 30K, do 10Ks before the race and then do the race. Because um, it's always much easier to get your distance during a race because there's like other people and there's, there's water stations and it's just a lack of vibe. Final thought now. Whether I'm a novice or a professional, a motivational idea for us moving throughout these 10 weeks towards the sixth. Hmm. <laughs> a motivational idea. Yo, it's always difficult. People always ask me, where does my motivation come from? And I, I really don't know. I just love running. Um, if I didn't run the day, I get it's so frustrated. So I'm, I'm addicted to running. So... I don't even need motivation to run. <laughs> now, we spoke about it earlier. Are you committing to the race this year? I have to. I already said yes. So, yeah, I'll be there. Um, I got all the equipment. I've, I've um, 
my fitness is not where it's supposed to be, but I also have the 10 weeks like you do. So, yeah, I'll just have to. Benny Aster, thank you for joining me today. And I look forward to seeing you in Ugrabis on the 6th of October. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Russell, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I look forward, but with trepidation, to meeting you in Ugrabis on the 6th. Look out for the orange hat. I can't wait to meet you, Kevin. And uh, you're going to have the time of your life. I, I have absolutely no doubt that you want to come back again next year. There you go. That is episode one of Your Came Kit Bag. We look forward to the next one over the next few weeks.